Thank you very much for joining me here today to have a look around the exhibition. I'm going to be a wee bit relaxed in how I sort of go around it and if there's any questions that come up during the time of me actually going over it, please just ask during, you know, as I'm sort of chatting away. Um, because sometimes if you get to the end, you, you forget what you were going to ask in the other room. Um, I'm actually going to go through, uh, I'm going to base what I'm talking about around the captions which are actually with the exhibition. So as Malcolm said, this project started back in 2019 and it, it kind of went on until this year actually all the way up to the, the exhibition was actually going to uh, start um, because I was still finalising bits of work with everybody. I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning of the project to give this sort of sense of um, what everything meant to me by the end of it because I think, I think projects like these are discoveries. I don't think you sort of start out saying I'm going to do exactly you know A, B, C and D. I think that what happens during that process is actually discovering where that project and the people that you meet take you and that shapes how you end up doing the work. So for me, these were the experiences that are hidden and they're experiences of precarity and stability. And most of all, there was about an adequate support that damages people's lives. To be without a permanent home is both that tangible and an emotional experience where the necessity for safety and security accompanies a need to belong. Within an ordinary Eden, people I worked with were from all over Scotland, so it wasn't just in <coughs> Glasgow or Edinburgh, but I worked uh, all the way up to Aberdeen, I worked in Dundee. I would like to have done a little bit wider, and that didn't happen because this was actually happening during the pandemic, which also kind of shaped how I could do the work a little bit as well. For me, when I'm thinking of home, I'm thinking about that sense of comfort that you can have, but also that comforts inside your own mind as well as the place. And I'm very interested in work when I'm doing it that I don't just want to talk about the physical reality of what someone's going through. I want to talk about how it's affecting them emotionally as well. But as I go around, I'm going to talk about some of the individuals in particular and the sort of things that came across from that. But what came across mostly is that it wasn't this idealized scenario. People didn't want uh, some kind of Eden, this future fantasy kind of idea. They actually wanted something that was quite normal, a regular life, a regular happy experience. They didn't want something which was uh, too fantastical, basically. They just wanted normal. And I think at the end of it, what I was sort of trying to get across, I was wanting to ask about care and compassion and dignity and ask about humanity about our, the systems that they are in society at the moment, from the power uh, that be that actually shape these systems, is it enough? And my feeling is that no, it's not enough. But I hope that once you actually look at the exhibition and engage with some of the sort of stories of people, you can also come to your own conclusions, because that's kind of what photography is for me a little bit as well. It's not about telling you what to think, it's about raising questions and asking you to come to your own conclusions as well. Over the four years that I worked on this, so people came from multiple kind of backgrounds. Um, there was people whose childhoods had, had experienced great inequality, but not everybody was like that. Um, others had uh, quite a lot of needs for mental health and addictions, uh, and they needed this joined up approach, which it wasn't quite working, basically. And other places, came from enforced escape, so people who had uh, domestic violence and also people who were fleeing war zones, so people who here as asylum seekers. And I think I want to get across that not having that home happens for many reasons, so it's not one simple, uh, one, one simple story. Um, there's all these sort of multiple nuanced and complex reasons that that's happening. And hopefully through the people in the show, you actually perhaps get a sense of that as well uh, through these personal stories. But also it was the amount of time in the years that was happening. And for me, that was about needless years lost. Why was it taking so long for, for things to be addressed? Why did somebody who was 16 years old not get a permanent home until he was 31? Why, what, what was happening during that time? Um, 
So I think I'm going to start by going up a little bit and walking along. So some people that I actually met had past experiences of homelessness. And as we know, homelessness doesn't just mean someone who's living on the street at that particular time. Homelessness uh, is, is a very, very large sort of criteria. So I met people who had been uh, uh, sleeping on the street. I met people who were couch surfing. Um, I met people who basically had been in and out of hostels for the majority of their adult life. Um, and some people for whom it was 10 years ago, but that actual emotional impact was still following them. Um, it, it followed them in life. It didn't ever quite leave. And Andrew, who is the first person here, is, a, is one of those people. And he told me that um, the past experiences clung to him. He couldn't quite shift them out of his, out of his mind that that would be something that might not happen again really easily in his life. Uh, it was always this uh, idea of um, precarity that he was experiencing. And when I met him, he was actually worried that he was about to get chucked out his rental accommodation. So it was, it was like all these feelings um, never quite left. And actually, but the reality was that precarity still existed. The, the text over on that side there is actually from Andrew. So I recorded interviews during the actual um, project. So I, I, don't, I didn't use the interviews as recordings, but I took them and turned them into pieces of text and to make sure that I was always documenting and representing people in the correct way, basically. And so that's, he told me that he ended up one day, he was in Edinburgh, and he basically walked to the meadows, if you know Edinburgh, and he stood there in the park and he thought, what do I do now? He had two black bags and he didn't know where to go. He'd ended up uh, without a home and uh, he didn't know, you know, what happens now. And he stood there and he, he sat down on a bench and he ended up sleeping in the park that night. And another person who was uh, homeless came up to him and said, don't sleep there, go to the cemetery because it's a lot safer. If you stay here, people, people will walk past you, they'll pee on you, they'll hit you. And that kind of like, you know, reinforced to me about that experience changed overnight for him. Which, and it was a really, really uh, distinct sort of uh, visual in my own mind about him standing there, uh, not knowing which path was he was going to take. Uh, over the years that I've now known Andrew, I'm very glad to say he now works as a house and rights advisor. Um, so a lot of these stories that have come from places sometimes of difficulty have turned out uh, and affected people to actually take their experiences and turn them into something which is going to help the next people behind them as well. And I like that idea a lot that, you know, some of the people in this show are actually doing that. Marcus um, is here and he's also through in the other room. And Marcus was down last week or the week before with me to actually visit the exhibition because he couldn't manage to come to the opening. He had something else on that day but he was very, very keen to come along to the exhibition. And when I met him, um, he'd just moved into a permanent place to stay. And he was 31 years old, and that was the first time he'd had summer to stay since he was 16. And I tell his story in one of the narrated videos. So it's, these little narrated videos are about a, one and a half minutes long. So please take the time to sort of listen to them in the gallery. And if not, they're also on the website, ordinaryeaton.com. Um, but Marcus also said to me something that was quite important. And that was that he felt like the, being part of the project and the exhibition, preparing for that with me, was actually part of his recovery. And I thought, I was actually really uh, taken aback when he said it. I was sitting in Tesco Cafe up in Mary Hill with him. And I thought, wow, I don't think someone's ever turned around to me and said something that I maybe wasn't so expecting. Um, I mean, I've worked a lot within communities and things. And, but this one really took me aback because I thought I did so little for him to have taken that out of, you know, to get that out from the project. And to me, that was quite amazing that these little changes can actually have this kind of effect on people's lives. Some people I met were in really precarious situations. So they weren't someone like Andrew when I met him. He was, you know, he was in, a, he was in somewhere to stay. But, you know, other people like MC were actually um, between hostels. They weren't even in, uh, they didn't even have hostel accommodation. They were completely didn't know where they were going next, staying with someone you know, they just met. But something that MC said to me was that all she really wanted was to be 
that mum again that got up in the morning and prepared her kids breakfast bowls uh, and you know went to school and uh, danced all the way home with her daughter again and it's these little stories and these little pieces of humanity for me these human stories which I really wanted to get across in the exhibition it wasn't so much about just these terrible experiences or something like that or you know uh, uh, table thumping about um, uh, policy it's also about listen to the people who've experienced these and are still experiencing these and you know can what kind of conversation can we create from that Lindsay was the first person that I met in the northern region I met her in 2019 and uh, and her story is actually told throughout the whole exhibition through in the next room the final sort of pictures are kind of a little bit of her journey which goes from uh, living in a hostel so I met her when she was living in a hostel uh, on the outskirts of Edinburgh in quite an isolated uh, location and she actually wrote something with me for Shelter Scotland back at that time and she tells her story so if you go into Shelter Scotland's blog you can actually read something that Lindsay wrote with me which went onto, the, into, onto their blog um, and she talks about why living in this isolated accommodation um, on the outskirts was so bad for her mental health but I actually, so when I met Lindsay, she was in the hostel and during the time of actually knowing her, she went into um, accommodation, she got a permanent home and during that process of getting that permanent home, she could re-establish her family life, she could re-establish her connection and her relationship with her daughter and get her daughter back as well. And I think that these, you know, the, the emotional stories of people are immense um, and they're sometimes not realised. So I worked quite intensively with the Time for Change group at Shelter Scotland. So I got in touch with Shelter Scotland at the beginning of the project, well, well into the beginning of the project before I even started it, and asked them if they would be interested in coming on as advisory partners with me at all. Um, and this is the kind of project I want you to do, and you know, would, would they be interested in being involved in that? And many months later, they sort of came back to me, you know, after discussion, seeing what, what they thought was um, they had this group called Time for Change group. And it was people with lived experience of homelessness. So some people were currently in hostels or to other temporary accommodation. And some people had been in the past, but all of them had lived experience. Um, and so some of those people, I went through and talked to them. I gave a presentation about my work and they could go away and think about it. And some of them got involved with me through that. Other people that I met came through just individual, uh, other people introduced me to them. But again, I went through that same process of uh, showing them my website, talking about myself, showing them books, showing them, you know, not just saying, oh, sit there and let me take your picture. So building a relationship. Um, so a real process, but, but not everybody got involved with me, you know? So some people came along and listened to me, but they didn't want to because putting yourself out there. I'm very clear at the beginning, this is public. Uh, it goes into, public you know, into the public domain. Um, but I also work closely with people in order that they are happy with captioning and the, the story that I'm telling. I'm very, very careful. Like Graham here, when I met him, had also just moved into a permanent home. So a lot of people were on this cusp of just changing from having something in their life which was quite different. Uh, to moving on to a new way of living and there was lots of hope involved in that and sometimes that hope carried through because sometimes I've now known them for maybe two or three years and sometimes I just hear something that actually you know it's a little bit of a, uh, a merry-go-round is actually what Marcus called it that he's maybe went back you know he's gone back onto that merry-go-round and then but he maybe will get off it again so sometimes people's stories are in this kind of ongoing fashion. And I know about these stories and because I'm keeping in touch and finding out about them. And I find them, I, I feel quite affected by it, you know? Um, but Graham, the last time I saw Graham, he ran, he gave me a lift home in his car. And not, not about a year and a half before that, he'd had nothing. But now he gave me a lift home in his car to, you know, back, back home. And uh, as we were driving, he actually pointed out, I think it's the Orin Moor, and he said, I used to go there and pick up the gouts in the morning, and I used to go there at two and three when nobody else would be there, but everybody had left. I would go there, get the best ones, because I was around the corner in a hostel. Um, and I thought, look at you, 
You know, look at you, look at you now. Look at what we, you know, because he's got that support network in place. He's actually managed. He's given me a lift home in his car. He's got a job. Everything's on this really good sort of progress for him. And but he's telling me a story that happened not that long ago for him. Uh, and it, so it's things like this that always really really stick in me. But the other thing was the round the corner. It says all I want is a happy, peaceful, normal life. And that's what Graham said to me in the car that day. So I've tried to take all these little bits of things that people have told me and put them throughout the exhibition. That's Graham's living room wall. So Graham's on the left and then that's his living room wall. So when I, when I first met Graham, he just moved into his permanent uh, place to stay. And I noticed the picture frame was actually, the first time I visited, his picture frame was on a radiator. And it's kind of like, you know, sort of squint lying there on the radiator and I noticed it at the time and I said to him oh, that's a nice picture frame and he sort of said yeah you know I'll, I'll do something with it kind of thing I went back several months later and by now the, the picture frame had moved and it had moved to the wall and to me it kind of has probably two messages so for it was he took a picture of himself in the love heart mirror and it's actually the one that's on the front of that book as well you know, I guess it's a bit about self-love and learning to love yourself. But the thing with the picture frame was that, for me, the emotional isolation that people go through when they have many years of uh, homeless experience can be, can be too much to bear sometimes. Um, Graham, I think, said to me, you know, the damage I've been through is, is too much. Um, and other people said things like, I'm broken, I'm broken by the experiences I've been through. And I hope that picture probably says a little bit of that emotional isolation, but I also hope that maybe there's room for that the future can go into that, so that these reconnections, many people make reconnections with their family, with their son, uh, for Graham, that was the, the case. Um, and he was making those reconnections. He has pictures of them in the book as well. And so those pictures will eventually appear in those frames. So it can be perhaps seen in two ways. I think it's really important in this kind of work to actually show how you do the work because a lot of the time if you walk into a gallery or into an exhibition you can't quite understand that process and for me the process is really important. It's not just about getting the pictures to put in a book or to you know, put on a website. It's about how I work with people and what you know, that interaction that's happening. So I've kind of done a couple of tables here which hopefully get some of that across. Um, and so these are like, I, I do lots of workbooks and I do lots of notes and I do lots of tight notes. I might meet someone and I'll go home at the end and I'll uh, type my notes up uh, or sometimes I'll write them in books. And it's, it's to try, when you're working with quite a lot of people, you're trying to find a way into their lives, um, but also find a way in which is a respectful way of working with people uh, and at their pace as well. So hopefully some of these pictures actually show a little bit of the reflection of um, how I'm working with people and doing that. And on the other side is actually some of the originals from the Finding Home book. So during the project, it hadn't been something I, had, I was intending to do at the start, but I have a, quite a, a long background from when I graduated in 94 um, of working within community arts practice. And so I like collaboration. I like to, I like to work with people uh, in certain ways. And I thought that it was actually important in this project to offer people um, you know, a choice. Do you want to have some kind of creative input into the project as well? Um, you don't need to, but I would like you to have a, some kind of input. It can be very small or it can be much bigger. And I didn't want to say to people, you have to take photographs because not everybody wants to do that. So some people, one man wrote a poem. Uh, some people wrote a life story. Um, another man did his uh, documented uh, handing out food during um, COVID when he was handing out food around Edinburgh. It's actually Michael who I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and you can see that process within that book. And um, the, the profits from this go to Shelter Scotland Time for Change uh, fund as well. For people, it's a hardship fund. So if people need money that day, uh, that's where the profits for that book go. 
And that, again, was decided with everybody who I was seeing. Um, and I think it was quite good because it's a way of a, a, not giving people a voice. Everybody's got a voice. It's about amplifying those stories, but amplifying them in a sense where it's in their, you know, people's own writing. It's in their own words. It's not about just uh, as a photographer, you go in and it's always your interpretation. You know, as we're shaping projects, we're, we're not manipulating the situation, but we are saying what we want to say. Uh, we're getting that across. And I think that by adding the book into it, it gives a, an additional element. So it's not about one is better than the other. It's about the two uh, interacting to, to make this project a little bit beefier, in a sense. Michael, who I worked with, was the second person in the project. And when I met Michael, I wasn't quite sure if, um, how it was going to go, you know? And I also met him through Shelter Scotland. At the time, he was living in temporary supported accommodation in Edinburgh. He is now in the Philippines. Uh, so people's lives evolve, change, things move on, you know. But back in very early 2020, just before the lockdown, the first lockdown happened, uh, that's, that's where Michael was. And that's actually his accommodation in Edinburgh. So these four pictures here are all of Michael. And I, I created quite a bond with Michael because he was someone who had uh, real insight into not only himself, but the situation, but also other people's experiences. And, um, you know, he, he had really sort of a real depth of knowledge of himself, but also the, the title's inspired by this tattoo that he has on his neck. And the tattoo says Eden on his neck, but it used to be other letters. And he overwrote those letters. It was, it was a message of hate and intolerance. And um, he overwrote that. He changed it. Because I said, that's a really interesting tattoo. And he told me the story that he changed this tattoo from one of hatred to this one, to me, which felt like hope, perhaps, or future. And I went away thinking a lot about this word Eden and also about what people were looking for. And eventually, that's where the title came from, this ordinary Eden that people weren't wanting the fantastical, but just the ordinary things in life. But it was inspired by this tattoo on Michael's neck. And he sort of, we would walk around a lot. So in Edinburgh, you know, he would take me to all the places that he used to sleep. And um, we also did a lot during the pandemic where I went on his food runs uh, with him and I actually photographed it for The Guardian. So there was some stuff that was in there. And um, it was about people who were still on the street at that point. So not everybody was getting house on that very first summer of the lockdown. And uh, he was going out, he was arranging to get food delivered to his temporary accommodation. And then he would sort it out. He was sometimes going buy the extras, the packets of crisps, things like that. Uh, sort of nice wee things, the toiletries that people weren't getting. Uh, suntan uh, cream, because people were sort of burning uh, in, the, in the heat. And he would put them in these bags and he would take them out and he would go around Edinburgh, he'd hand them out and he did this for the entire summer. And then he, he moved on to a different thing afterwards as well. But, you know, Michael had this great insight, I think, and he was very spiritual. He wasn't saying that he was ever one religion, but he just had this deep, deep spirituality which helped him. But one thing that struck me at the very beginning was as we were walking around, and it was in March um, 2020, we met three people one after another at, at the beginning of lockdown, and they were saying... We went to the Salvation Army and they told us tomorrow we're shut. And then uh, they were just going to be handing some things out at the door for people. And I looked around and there was all these people sitting there and it was their community where people would come, even if they were in temp accommodation or other forms of where they were. This was a, a, a social place to come to. So that was going to close. And I thought, whoa, that's you know, going to be difficult for people to not have this any longer. And then we met uh, somebody from Michael's uh, church and they said, oh, we're stopping the groups uh, from tomorrow as well. We, can't, we have to close everything down. I mean, we all remember that, what it was like. You know, it might seem quite distant in our, in our minds you know, now, but everything was closing down quite significantly. And then we met someone else, and the same thing happened. And I, I left thinking, wow, everything that keeps Michael stable and secure and on the right path for him, he, he was in recovery himself, is closing. You know, what's going to happen to people with these needs over this very first summer of lockdown. Michael turned it around and he started handing out food. So that, that's what kept him on that path, basically, of being able mentally to cope with it. 
Um, I met another man who's round the corner who um, also was in a hostel in the Cowgate during that time, and he went out cycling, and actually all his cycling photographs are in the book. So have a wee look at the book uh, before you leave. I also want you to get across things like the physical manifestation sometimes of this emotional pain. And I'm not someone who likes to photograph people uh, naked for no reason. Uh, as you can probably see, there's not a lot of it in the exhibition or in any of my work. But I think maybe the third time I met Michael, we were sitting having a coffee and he told me about his scar, that he was in a lot of pain because he had this, um, he had to have an operation on his collarbone. And it had, it had happened through uh, violence because of his previous lifestyle. And this had been ongoing for quite a long period of years. And eventually he had the operation. And so he had the scar and he was healing from the scar. And for, for me, it was a lot about his mental uh, mental pain that he was in as well was having this manifestation on the outside and I said to him would you mind if I photographed your scar obviously you know you can say no and uh, he said he was so laid back about everything and he was like sure and I said and so we did the picture and I would take pictures back to people so that they see the pictures other people I would sometimes send them by whatsapp or email straight away so people were always getting copies of the photographs you know, so people were coming from histories of domestic uh, abuse. And so uh, the, the woman that I met uh, in the picture here, um, she's called Name Withheld because she doesn't want her identity shared um, at all, basically, and that's fine. And I also have another photographer of her in the next room as well. But they're taken over a year apart, but she still isn't showing her face. She still doesn't feel safe to show her face because of where her experiences come from. And it was quite important that um, this aspect was actually brought into it, that it wasn't just about people who were in uh, substance recovery, for example, or you know, other sort of methods of, of not having a home. Domestic violence is actually quite a large, for men and women, is actually quite a, a big reason for people ending up not having a permanent home. And this woman said she had lost everything. She'd basically lost everything that was dear to her. She had to leave everything that was material behind. She had to leave very quickly. Um, but she also had to leave all those personal connections. So she lost both things uh, by having to, to leave that previous life. And she was also um, worried. She wanted to be in the project, but she didn't want to show her face. So I had to come up with suggestions for her of how we could do this. And so every time I photographed uh, with her, um, I send her the photographs afterwards and she approves them and then the text that I use with the photographs is also approved by her. Um, so this is, is a real process so it's not just again about going in to take a photograph and leaving, it's very much about creating those relationships with people where you build up trust but also they, they can come back and say I don't like the way you've written that, can you rephrase it and we work through that together. It's not really happened because hopefully I'm actually writing it in such a way. I do have one picture at the end where I took a picture of a man out um, because of something where we felt it wasn't safe. But, you know, and she's very proud. She was here at the opening, you know. She came all the way, quite a distance, to come to the opening. And one of the pictures that's in the other room is actually also in the Taylor Wessing exhibition, which opens next month as well at the Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh. Um, and so she's very excited because she'll go to that opening as well. These things are, you know, she says being involved in the project has given her something. It's given her a sense of pride to be involved in this. It's like she was feeling that she couldn't contribute in some ways, but now she's actually, uh, it's, a, it's about standing up a little bit and uh, taking that experience that she's had and uh, working with that in order to, to basically say something new with it. I think that, that for me was quite important. So people were in all different situations and I haven't put, I haven't put captions up next to them because I want, I want people to come in and look at the photographs and uh, react in this kind of emotional way. I want to come in and feel the pictures a little bit without just going up and reading the captions straight away. The captions are available but I don't want them only to be 
I want them to be looked at as this set of photographs. So that's why the captions are not with them. But I hope that, you know, if you read them, you get this little bit more in depth from them. The woman on the, the very first photograph was in that situation where she was moving from hostel to hostel. She had no place. I met her one night. We'd got in touch through another friend and took her for something to eat. And she talked to me about her situation, I asked her about being involved in the project. Um, and we kept in touch through WhatsApp for quite a period of time. And then I went to photograph her. And during that time, she'd been moved from three different hostels in Glasgow. This is only in late 21. So we're not talking 10 years ago. You know, this is something that happened very recently. And eventually it became too much and she went back to her previous situation. Um, so these stories are still ongoing. I, I met and photographed people up until last year with this, but these stories are happening all the time. They're, we're surrounded by it. Tam, uh, Tam works for Shelter Scotland now. He's a development worker there, just from the corner, actually, the office, the Glasgow office. But Tam slept on the street for seven years. He slept to, you know, under motorway bridges. Uh, he's got photographs of that in the book. I've got, I think, photographs of it in, this, in the video. Um, I show the location where Tam was sleeping. And he told me when we, he met me, you know, I'll, I often go and just hang out with people. I don't just go and photograph them the first time I meet them. I hang out, try to understand a wee bit of their life. And so I go for coffee or go for some eat, whatever, whatever is, is suits the person best. And Tam told me about his balcony. And it's the thing that struck me when he told me about it. Sometimes somebody will say something and in your mind, it's all that stays there about this is really, really important to this person. And he said, oh, I got my balcony and I got my artificial grass and I laid it in the balcony and I'm creating my garden. Um, and it was really important to him, not only he had the house, he had the garden now. And he can sit in his garden and he can look out and look out over his city, you know, look out over Glasgow. And this kind of symbolism for me was really important that I knew that when I wanted to photograph him, because I hadn't photographed him yet, um, I would go there and photograph him and on his balcony, on his artificial grass. Um, but he had many, many years of different experiences. And he's, he writes a really, really um, sort of raw account of that in the book as well. Uh, I asked Tam if he would like to write something for me. I didn't shape it, I didn't change it, I didn't edit it. Um, and he wrote it and he emailed it to me. And that's what's in that book. And it's actually quite, it's quite a long account. And he's very hard on himself. Um, and I find that this, as many times when I've met people, they're very judgmental of themselves. They think that a lot of things are their own fault. And I think that sometimes that comes through a recovery process, through, through sometimes some of the programs that people are on. Or sometimes it's actually a way of en enabling themselves to move forward is to say, I take the responsibility for, for such and such happening. And I think that I'm not going to make a judgment on that. That's people's own choices, how they, how, how they can manage to move on in their lives. But Sam is, uh, Tam is someone I've got great admiration for um, because of now what he does. And he basically helps other people who are in the situation that he once was. And he was in that situation for many, many years. Other people I met, um, Connor, who's here, and Connor's also over on the other wall with a sort of wallpaper missing. Some people I met, I felt, were really quite vulnerable. And, but that vulnerability isn't just to do with the home. Because Connor now had a permanent home, but he'd, had, he'd been there for two years, but he didn't have any support. So he needed something in addition to what he was being offered. Um, and th when I went in, Connor sort of uh, laid it on the table for me and he sort of explained to me his whole history. I'm not going to go into his history, but he explained to me his whole history and who he was and what was happening. And I think he was trying to scare me to get me to go away or to see if I would stay. And four hours later, we made this picture, you know? So it's about being able to take that time, I think, with people 
and engage with them. And then I would then send by WhatsApp and email everything to Connor. And then he also wrote something and put it in the book as well. But he'd been at university and he became overwhelmed. And after he became overwhelmed with life, he ended up um, in many of the hostels throughout Glasgow. And that was his sort of, his journey in a sense. But now he was in this permanent place to stay, but still overwhelmed. So, Graham is also, who was on the blue wall around the corner. So there's sort of little, little repetitions of people as you go around and a little bit more of their story, which you can access on the captions. Lindsay, who was in the first room, in the really, really big picture, first person I met. And so I went back with Lindsay um, as she was rebuilding her relationship with her daughter. And, and her daughter would be coming uh, to, to stay with her more and more. And it was going through this slow process, but really positive process, basically. Um, when I'd walked into the room, she told there was this cuddly to toy lying on the bed. And I said to her, oh, that's a nice cuddly toy. And, you know, just, just chit chat. And she said that her daughter had given it to her. And she gave it to her for her to hug for when she wasn't there. And for when she missed her, she was to hug the cuddly toy. Um, so in a sense, it is a little reversal. And that little of the, the daughter protecting the mother. And that probably came into play a little bit when I was doing this picture. And as I was doing it, Lindsay was uh, sitting and she, she actually, I didn't ask her to hold the toy. She actually reached for it and I think probably I would have actually not had her holding the toy in the picture, but she picked it up. So that's part of allowing a portrait to happen in a sense, is to see how someone reacts in the situation. It's not about just direction. It's about, I like to observe people a lot and see what they do. And with Lindsay, she reached for the toy, so I had to bring this into the picture as well. Um, Div, uh, also I have a sort of narrated sort of story about Div on the video as well. And he was someone who also had this sort of many, many years. I mean, we're talking about almost 20 years. It's not like two years of instability, mental health, various experiences, shelters, um, uh, prison and he came out of the last time he came out of prison it was actually in the pandemic uh, I can't remember if it was first lockdown second one and he came out and he was given a 74 pound liberation grant given it and he was many miles from home he was in a different uh, uh, I think he was in came out click Manningshire and he lived in Dundee and he was given this money and said um, okay get on with it here's a phone number for housing and he phoned them and they said they were very polite with him but they said, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are, and basically hung up. Um, so there he was on his own, out of, just got out of prison. And this is, again, this isn't like 10, 20 years ago. This is happening two years ago. Um, Div went back up to Dundee. He got into a hostel eventually. And, but the problem was it was very difficult during the, the, during the lockdowns to be in situations like that as well. Um, but also when he was going into the hostels, they're trying to close the hostels in Dundee, is that as soon as you go in, and many people have said this as well about they feel unsafe, insecure, people banging on their door or offering, offering uh, substances that they'd already got out of. So it's like this temptation that's being set up to fail in some ways uh, by not being given the proper support when you've came from one, uh, one experience to another and then saying, well, we're not going to support you anymore, just go back the way. I'm also really glad to say that Div also works for Shelter Scotland part-time now. So he's taken those experiences and he's using them again to inform, uh, you know, to inform his knowledge and take it out to other people. And a lot of the time what you find is even if people work for an agency or an organisation, they'll also in their spare time go and volunteer in other places as well. And a lot of the people in here who are on that kind of, who are quite steady at the moment, are volunteering at the same time as perhaps working. The text at the top is actually from Michael. And, you know, we'd had many conversations and I said to him, you know, where do you want to go, Michael? And he just said, well, somewhere slightly better than here. Um, so it's not, he didn't want this, you know, that's, he didn't want that fantasy. He didn't want this 
you know, thing that was going to be so unattainable in life. He didn't want the, the, you know, the gold and the jewels and the fame. He just wanted something that was slightly better than his temporary accommodation that he was in. It didn't need to be uh, that much better, just slightly. After I met um, Marcus, who's in the first room and he's against the sort of wall, the wall which is, uh, you can see it like, looks like plaster, it's getting redone. I went back again and by this point um, Marcus had decorated. Uh, he wanted me to come back and to show the difference. And in the table there's actually a picture which has him standing against the wall in the same place but once he's decorated as well. And this was his first Christmas that he had had a permanent home since he was a child. So when he was a child, he got, uh, he didn't, ha you know, he was made homeless, and he was in uh, some places where, you know, for children, um, at that point, and then he went through mental health centres. Um, I'm going to actually read out his quote rather than, uh, because sometimes people said things I think that were quite. quite eloquent in, in actually understanding the ways that their life had sort of went. I have to leaf through my multiple. I've been on a merry-go-round. I don't think there's any of the homeless hostels in Glasgow I haven't been in, and I've been barred from everywhere. And people get barred because, of, uh, because they have some kind of substance issue. So there, there wasn't that support for people who needed that extra bit. It was just a straight off bar. And Tam also talked a lot about that as well. That's why he ended up, you know, sleeping under bridges. So he was in, Marcus was in hostels to hostels, the prison, mental health centres, emergency shelters. And so that went on from being like a teenager, from being, from losing, you know, when you left home, uh, through to age 31. And for me, going to, his home for his first Christmas was actually really poignant in, that, in a way. Um, and in the shadow of that, in this house, there's a tiny little Christmas tree. And, uh, but there, there wasn't anything underneath it. Um, but the, by the next Christmas, he'd made those reconnections with his family. He'd managed to uh, reconnect with many friends. Um, and he was really surprised. He thought, why did it take me so long? Uh, and again, it's a little bit of that, that taking too much responsibility for it because I think, you know, Marcus was a child and that shouldn't, us as a society, but really policy makers, so people in power, um, there should be different answers here for this kind of thing not being allowed to happen in the first place. But he was very surprised that it took him so long in his own mind to actually address his own addiction issue, which was with alcohol. And he's quite open about that. Um, and just actually get home. He says, it's brilliant, I love it, I've got the life I want. And uh, he's getting on very well, he's working part time. Daniel is in both these pictures, so it's the same person that's in these photographs. And when I met Daniel, he was in the, living in the Cowgate in Edinburgh. And he said to me, nobody would know that I'm homeless when you walk past, because I look quite good. You know, and uh, um, nobody knows what I've been through in my life. And he, again, his, his history goes back to childhood. And his homeless experience goes back to age 16, I think it was. He said, I've slept in empty houses, stairwells, parks, and we couldn't go into the hostels because they had rules and we were too chaotic. And what he meant by that was their lives were too chaotic. They're, you know, they were teenagers and uh, they couldn't go into the hostel so they would just get thrown out again. So again, it's about asking how can we um, make policy better that that's not happening, that people are getting better support at that age. Two years later, I did the photograph on the bottom. Um, and as actually, Daniel and I WhatsApp an awful lot. And he sends me photographs all the time. He takes a lot of photographs and he set up his own Instagram account uh, during the whole process of this project, which I, I love, you know, that he's actually started to do that. Um, and so there's little, little things that came out of the project, which I, can't, was, I never expected, and which are kind of the, the rewards for me seeing what people take these personal kind of understandings out of it. 
Um, but Daniel is coming through next week uh, to see the uh, to visit the exhibition. He wasn't able to come. So he says, I was 16 when I was kicked out and first became homeless, and I've been in about 20 different hostels in my life. I'm 38 now, and I've finally grown into the man I was meant to be. And I guess that's him and his personal leading at the bottom, you know, and you go into someone's, into someone's house and you think, this feels a little bit ideal for the project, you know, because he had this kind of beautiful scene on his bedroom wall. Um, and I really liked that. We'd gone from this invisibility of who he was in life through to him being in his own personal leading. Back to the woman who was in the other room, who was uh, name withheld. She said to me, we have uh, quite a lot of phone calls. So some people want to email, some people want to WhatsApp, and some people phone you. And this woman here, we phone quite a lot. We have lots of phone conversations. And she said to me that she felt like, you know, that we, we became friends, friends during the process of the project, which is always nice to hear. Um, and we don't just talk about the project, you know, we talk about other things. I'm going to read out a little bit about, about this photograph and about her situation. After three years of living first in homeless hostels and then inadequate housing, so when I met her, she was in, in that inadequate housing. It was a studio flat, one room, um, one single bed. She'd left her previous life. Uh, to me, there was no dignity in that situation for her. She now is sitting here, and this is in her permanent home. So I went back to visit her again and I, I photographed her in her permanent home over a year later. And she became homeless through domestic abuse and recounted that she felt doubly punished. She not only lost all that was associated with her previous life, personal and material, but also had to endure the emotional and practical impact of being homeless. And this house is a new start for her, but the indelible trace of trauma remains significant. So even though this physical practical element is addressed, there's still these emotional parts that need to be supported as well. Um, so that for me is a, a, a big part of, of the questions that remain at the end of this project is about that. The very final wall is really that sort of story about Lindsay. So this is when she was in the hostel, this is actually in the hostel. Uh, she told me that actually this hostel used to be a children's home and um, her sister had been in that children's home. And again, this is all public information. So this is something she's written about publicly and it's on the web before I'm sort of... I never tell people anything which is not already out there publicly or been approved by people. Um, she felt very lost when she was there and very, uh, very vulnerable basically because of the, where it was. You, would, you got the bus from Edinburgh, and I think it was 40 minutes on the bus. Uh, 40 minutes on the bus, terminus, you get off the terminus, and then you walk another 10 minutes along a country road, and then, um, and then you walk up the sort of wooded sort of entryway into the hostel. And I, I kind of, I, my mind was a wee bit blown the first time I, I thought, well, you know, but probably they thought this is a really nice place that people could come and relax. This is surrounded by countryside, but actually when you're, isolation. that's the thing that's felt. It's the isolation, it's exclusion. Um, and, you know, putting someone there who, who really actually needs lots of support. Uh, the, there was no support, she told me, no support. Yeah. Then she got her, this is where she, the area where she got her permanent home. And then a final picture with her, with her daughter. Uh, which in some ways is a, a sort of nice picture, but I think you actually need those nice pictures. You need that, that kind of softness uh, in photography sometime, and not just the, the, the harsher parts of people's stories. Um, there has to be a balance for me when I'm working, that not everything is uh, about trying to... I, I try not to be sensational in my work. I try to just work in a way which is about the, the, the individual. The very final picture was actually a portrait. And I really loved this portrait. <laughs> so it was quite difficult for me in some ways. And it was a portrait I took near the end of last year. 
and um, it was a man I met, and he was an asylum seeker. Um, but, and this is temporary accommodation. And we, we took his portrait in it. And then after a period of, you know, many weeks of uh, meeting him, and we decided that actually there was too much risk. Uh, and uh, uh, took the portrait out because of it. And I said to him, I would still like to put, I'd actually, by chance, taken a picture of the setup which is what you're seeing here. You're not seeing like a, a picture that I did. It's a setup. I was checking my exposure probably and um, before he sat down. And this was his temporary accommodation again in Glasgow, again, very recent. And, uh, and then I wrote a little bit about that story is about sometimes the stories and the histories and the experiences of people are actually just too much. They're too much too much risk in sharing those stories publicly. So there has to be other ways of working with that. Um, and I, so I, I just want that kind of thought uh, to be in, in people's minds when they visit the work and they've sort of engaged with it, maybe listened to videos, read the captions, is to go away thinking that these are, uh, this is a very small amount of what is actually happening. And there's a lot more out there um, that people are currently today uh, going through these experiences. So that's it. <laughs>